And so Brian was, uh, of course, um, the GIS manager in, in Pasadena before going to Esri. And now he finds himself at House Seal Levine. House Seal Levine? Oh, Levine, I'm sorry. I thought I got it right. I thought I was getting it right. Dang it. <laughs> Second okay. guess yourself, eh? I got the House Seal right. Okay, well, anyway, it's a great place. I'm going to get it wrong again, but Brian's going to get it right, and he's going to tell you all about the things that they're doing. It's really great stuff. So, Brian, you take it away. All right. So just a quick uh, clarification. You can see my screen. Is that correct? Yes. All right. Excellent. All right. Well, uh, thank you for having us today. Uh, my colleague, Rob Matthews, is not able to join us. Uh, he has a meeting with some council members on another project. So um, you get uh, stuck with me for the rest of the, uh, the time today. So I'm um, going to talk a little bit about some of the work that we're doing around scenario planning in support of uh, economic revitalization and housing production. Um, it is going to be mostly about housing production, uh, a little bit at the end about uh, economic revitalization, how we're kind of connecting the two. So quick little agenda, um, some introductions into who we are, who I am, um, and then a little bit on why housing is important um, beyond some of the obvious reasons. Um, and then we're going to spend some time on uh, recent changes in housing uh, policy here in California for those who are unfamiliar with some of the important changes that are going on right now. And then um, we'll move into a live demonstration. And hopefully, if I don't spend too much time talking on my intro slides, we will spend most of the time uh, in live demos instead of in slide land. And then, like I said, lastly, on economic revitalization. So real quickly, an introduction into who we are at House of Levine. Um, we're a, a Chicago-based uh, planning firm, um, and we've done projects all over the country, uh, traditional uh, urban planning-related projects, comprehensive plans, downtown plans, corridor plans, and uh, worked in um, it's over 20 different states. Uh, I see Texas is not on the list. We're about to start a project in the new year working with the city of Dallas on their comprehensive plan. And uh, we recently opened an office in Southern California, uh, which I opened with my colleague, Rob Matthews. Um, we had an office based in Pasadena until uh, COVID hit and now we just work at home. Uh, but uh, we are uh, based in Pasadena for the team out here and uh, focused on kind of innovative approaches to urban planning and bringing in GIS into our work. Quick few examples of some of the types of work that we're known from the firm. And really we see here, you know, some really high quality visualizations that kind of bring the, the traditional planning work and, and a lot of the text and the analysis and maybe static maps into these high quality 3D visualizations in, um, in new ways and using Esri platform for that. Uh, this is a project where the firm won a uh, special achievement in GIS for. Another one uh, that was also um, a, a special achievement in GIS award and as well as a, an APA technology award uh, in the city of Morrisville, North Carolina. And as soon as in the upper right, uh, we'll start seeing um, this little dude uh, hipster running around. We'll take a look at this uh, in a few minutes in some more detail. But uh, just a, an introduction there to the firm. Uh, for me, I am a, a principal with the firm. I started in January. Uh, my background is in geography, GIS. Um, as Nick mentioned, uh, I was the GIS manager for the city of Pasadena for seven years. Uh, I then went and spent uh, nine years at Esri, uh, where I spent a lot of time working on 3D and 3D cities and 3D GIS. And I'm now bringing that to uh, that experience uh, to House of Levine. So wanted to, let's go ahead and transition into the specifics around housing and, and just talk a few minutes about setting the stage for why we should care about housing and the issues that are going on around uh, the housing topic. Um, for anybody who pays attention to this stuff loosely, uh, it takes very little uh, searching to find numerous articles, uh, both in the US and internationally around the need and shortage of housing. Uh, again, both domestically, we see some titles here in, in New Zealand and Ireland and England. Uh, Hong Kong, and, and really the, the issues are not unique just to, uh, to us here in the United States. And, you know, beyond the obvious issues of, you know, needing a place to live and to get out of, um, uh, out of nature and, and have a place, a uh, roof on our head to, to cook food and sleep at night, um, there are other important issues around housing that, that should be recognized, one of which is, is an economic impact. 
and kind of the, um, the reduced spending power that folks have if they're spending so much money in the discretionary spending on housing. It uh, is less money that can be circulating around the economy for other things or put into savings. Um, there's obviously an environmental impact as people, um, this kind of idea of driving to quality, dri driving to qualify. Um, to be able to qualify for a loan, I have to go out further and further to where um, housing is cheaper. That uh, induces sprawl and requires people to drive really far, which can drive up environmental impacts. And also this notion of kind of a multi-generational um, impact where um, as people need, want to move into their first home, move into a second home as their family grows, and then maybe downsize as they get older. Um, because of the increased pricing, it is that, that kind of that natural turnover, the housing economy starts to break down. Um, and then also there's an obvious need for affordable housing for the folks who are kind of at the lower rungs of the socioeconomic class and the affordability. Um, and when the bottom of the market rises up so high, um, because of the overall uh, cost of housing, that more and more people um, are unable to afford uh, housing and then are forced into their cars and forced out on the street. And so um, you know, some obvious impacts there uh, related to housing. So here in California, there are some housing policy related issues uh, that are uh, going around throughout the state as a need to try and address uh, the problem. Uh, just real quickly, uh, just a quick qualifier. Um, I'm going to go into what some of these policies are, um, and these are really from a uh, trying to be from a factual standpoint and not trying to get into the politics and, and issues that come up around housing, um, really just putting the information out there for us to understand. So there's uh, this thing called uh, the California Regional Housing Needs Assessment or RENA. Uh, I apologize for the level of detail here for the folks who understand this and know all about it, but for those who don't. Um, the idea is to try and create the opportunity for more housing in, around the state at various levels of income. Um, this is not an attempt to produce government-built housing or purchasing of land by the government, but really is about providing the regulatory framework that makes housing production more possible and at greater amounts. Um, it is also not a guarantee that housing will actually be developed. And the intent here uh, is to create the, um, the amount of housing um, by the 2029 timeframe. And in terms of the amount of housing at a statewide level, um, the state is intending to produce a staggering um, 2.1 million new homes statewide. Um, and that, again, that these policies should be creating the, um, the framework that allows for that much housing production. Um, underneath that, in the bullets, we see how that allocation breaks down into some of the major metropolitan areas across the state. And when we look at the, uh, the, the counties there in blue for this, the area of the Southern California Association, California Association of Governments, um, we can see how that allocation of 1.3 million homes um, is being allocated to these uh, um, six different counties. And when we take a look at that and how that plays out in terms of, uh, you know, we're looking at 3,000 new homes per week over the next uh, eight to nine years. Um, so that's a, a pretty daunting uh, um, challenge that, that local governments are faced with. Um, I should say that the, um, the, the, the time frame that everyone is running up to right now is October 2021, which is when these uh, planning efforts need to be completed and submitted to the state for review. Um, so uh, folks who are involved in this effort are uh, not sleeping very much these days. And why is this really important from a need perspective? We, we've got 10% of households are, are overcrowded. Uh, that's close to 7% above the national average. And then from a low income households are spending 70% of their income on housing. Uh, again, so there's a, a big economic impact on, on people's daily lives uh, in terms of trying to be able to have enough housing. As we kind of zoom in on this, um, we're gonna take a look at a case study uh, and a project that we are actually working on in uh, the city of Claremont, um, a small, uh, basically suburban community within LA County. And we can see that the, um, the city has an allocation of 1700 households and we can see the breakdown uh, at the various income levels. Uh, and just to kind of tie that to some actual real numbers here, um, for the folks in that, that very low and low income bracket, 
the um, the household income is um, under 90K for low income and then drops way down to um, 56,000 for very low incomes. And then that then relates to the um, you know, $1,400 uh, a month for uh, rental incomes in, in, in this uh, location, of which uh, there are none at that price point. Um, there were a handful uh, in a recent survey at the, around the 2,000 a month uh, level. So what I'd like to do now is to transition into kind of a geospatial based approach uh, that we've put together uh, to try and help address these uh, challenges. And while we are working for the city of Claremont on this effort, my examples that I'm showing here are not necessarily representative of the effort in Claremont and are, are very much a, a demonstration set of examples. Um, so don't come out to our, our first public meeting and complain about what you've seen here. And I say that with a smile. Um, <laughs> so let me switch over to um, the first bit of technology that we're going to take a look at here. So here we're taking a look at a product from Esri called ArcGIS Urban. Um, in my time at, at Esri, this was a product that um, and me and my colleague Rob Matthews uh, did a lot of the early development work and design work on these tools, worked with the team over in Zurich to help um, translate those requirements into the software. Uh, it was released about a year and a half ago at the Esri User Conference in 2019. And it's a web-based uh, 3D long-range planning tool. Uh, really, the idea is to hide a lot of the GIS. The, one of the things I say is that you should be able to use, with a, use this tool without having to have a black belt in GIS. Um, it's intended for planners and, and is very much in planner language and planner mindset and not necessarily the, the things that we think of in, in terms of a traditional GIS. And you know, our process really starts out with by creating a 3D base map. And if I were to zoom in here, we can see if I tilt the map, you know, this is a 3D environment and we can see we've got the mountains in the background, our foothills. And as I zoom in, we can start to see some of the 3D buildings. These are some relatively simple 3D buildings that were created using uh, LA County 3D data uh, with the simple, um, uh, uh, simple uh, single elevation and uh, simple extrusions. There are other tools that are out there from Esri that allow you to take your LiDAR data, your building footprints and extract higher quality 3D buildings that aren't just flat roofs. Um, but this allows us to get a better sense of kind of what's on the ground today. We can see that this is a residential neighborhood. This is um, more of a commercial neighborhood. And, and if we wanted to site something here on this vacant lot, you know, what is the surrounding community? What is the site like uh, on the ground today? Some of the other things that we can bring into here that help us kind of understand what's on the ground uh, today might be information, uh, in this case, coming from the county on uh, the year built of every property. And I'm waiting for my information to stream in. There we go. So this is information on the year built. Um, so anybody who works with LA County Assessor Data recognizes this information. Now this can be useful for understanding where properties may or may not um, be likely to turn over from a redevelopment standpoint, uh, recognizing that older properties are more likely to develop than uh, newer properties. We can look at this um, TCAC HUD opportunity zone. So one of the efforts um, in this housing uh, round is to try and place more housing where there are more resources within the community already. We can see those in areas of blue and then areas in this lighter shade of greenish yellow are areas with lower resources. So there's more impact from environmental conditions. There's maybe low te uh, school uh, resources, so forth and so on. So the intent is to try and again, place more housing in the higher resourced areas. And so having this information allows us to understand that. We can take those individual values and then do things like looking at densities of residential in yellow five to minutes. red. Wow. Sorry. Yeah, five I thought, minutes. I thought we had 25. To get to the Q&A. We want to get to the Q&A, that's all. So you can go through it. You keep going. Okay, very good. Okay. All right. All right. Um, so I will move things along. And so we've got all this um, basic uh, information that we can get a sense for layer by layer. But you know, as we know, bringing more and more data to the problem doesn't necessarily bring about understanding. 
So another tool that we can use um, produced by Esri, another web-based 3D tool that connects with the same data that Urban does, allows us to um, bring in each individual data point as, a, um, as an element in this overall model. And I can then go through and, um, for instance, my year built, I can categorize my, my development by years and then provide scores saying that older, built, older properties uh, would get a higher score versus a lower score for newer properties. Or I could go through and do categorical exclusions uh, for say things like vacant lots uh, include or high fire zones as an exclude. Once that model runs, I get an overall weighted suitability score. And I can see that by clicking on this one property and kind of interrogate those results. The intent is to try and find needles in a haystack by looking at various criteria. So if we come back to ArcGIS Urban, we can start to see some of those results in these parcels with dark, uh, dark black outlines. And if I turn on these future buildings, we can start to see how this development pattern might play out in one scenario. In this case, I've got kind of a, a dispersed uh, set of developments around the city. And if I were to zoom in, I can start to see how those developments look within the context of the existing built environment. And I could then very quickly switch to another scenario and see how that development pattern plays out across the city. In this case, I've got things concentrated around this proposed light rail station, as well as seeing the increased density and how that plays out within the community. Now, importantly, we can then start to get a sense for the, um, the, the household generations that can be created against these different plans. And I can see the amount of existing housing compared to the future amounts of housing, and then compare and contrast that between these two scenarios. So for the sake of time, I won't go into what it takes to actually um, create these buildings, but suffice to say that by playing around with some of the, the parameters that are common in zoning codes, we can get these simple schematic forms on, on a single property, tens, hundreds, or thousands of properties at a time at a zoning level and see how those things play out across various scenarios. Now, one of the things that we specialize again at House of Levine is those, those visualizations. And so we can go from these schematic forms and bring it into this environment where we've used City Engine to create facades of buildings, streetscapes, and uh, landscaping, and then bring it into a gaming engine like Unreal Engine and start to be able to create this kind of video game like experience that allows people to run around the community and visualize it in, in different scenarios and kind of really sell the vision and understand what their future community might look like. So let me go ahead and switch back and I'll bring us into the finish line here. So just real uh, quickly on, on economic revitalization, um, one of the areas that we're looking at trying to help out with is this identification of underperforming um, and failing or vacant commercial properties. We know that there's uh, an increasing number of those as a result of, of COVID and being able to do kind of uh, land design, site design in this um, graphic uh, driven experience where we can create capacity metrics um, based on those different build outs and understand how we can um, kind of increase density and reimagine some of these, um, these spaces within our communities uh, that might be underperforming where we can look for increased revenue, uh, increased land use efficiency, and then be able to communicate that with developers and the public in a, in a better way. So um, I guess with that, I will wrap up and open things up for questions. All right. All right, Brian, thank you very much. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to scare you with the five minutes. You know, that, <laughs> we just want to make sure we have time for Q&A, that's all. Yeah, I was, I was watching and I was like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm coming right. in pretty well. It's, yeah, and you are, and you're fine. And so we we do have a question. And if you wanna if you wanna ask Brian a question, go ahead and queue it up in the uh, in the Q and A. Um, I'll get to this first one here right now. And we'll just uh, do you have a contact slide by the way? Maybe the last one, or um, go back to your first slide. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, just for the background. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is a question from Fred, and he says. You know, given that there's a great need for low income housing, um, example, areas like Long Beach and some other places throughout the county, uh, obviously the GIS platform may draw attention to some of the disparities. Could you comment on how you can use GIS to impact housing policy? Um, well, I mean, I could kind of take that in a, a lot of different directions. So, I mean, there's, 
you know, there's, there's identification of where there is a need. And, and part of the process that's been defined by the state is, is using numerous data, data layers to understand where there is need and being able to, um, to try and place housing in the communities, obviously, where, where there is the need, but also trying to look for, I guess, um, opportunities to try and, if, if you will, co-locate housing near transit opportunities, near schools, near parks, uh, near retail centers, so people aren't have to necessarily get in their car and drive everywhere. Um, you know, from a, a, a policy standpoint, I guess our thought and our approach this is, um, you know, it more of a a local level and influencing the uh, the planning policy to create the structure for the opportunity for housing through densification. It's going to be very challenging for for most communities to meet their arena housing needs without some form of zoning change. And so the intent here is to try and create sound new policy by testing out things in kind of this real world scenario driven fashion. So we can understand the impacts of the decisions that we're making in advance of, of, uh, of the, um, you know, the, the enactment of, uh, of policy. Sure. So I, I hope that answers your question. If not follow up in the, in the chat. Sure, I'm sure. And to be honest, my department, we're doing a lot with housing right now. My group, I have one, one of my staff is that's all he's working on is housing stuff. And they said till March or April, at least, because we have those arena deadlines, just like everybody else. So uh, absolutely. This one came in the chat. I want to get to this one. It says you showed several pictures with 3D building extrusions atop of a, of a map layer. Do you have the volumetric data for these structures or do you estimate them? Uh, or use existing data from property assessors or real estate information? In the creation of those models? Um, no, we, we create those um, by using um, the existing building footprints where possible. Uh, we, can, we can actually extract the building footprints themselves from LIDAR. Uh, we can take existing building footprints and run an, uh, um, a, a check against the LIDAR to try and find change where buildings have, have been demolished and new buildings have been added. Um, from those building footprints, uh, you can then uh, extract the 3D volumes and get, the, um, uh, get the, the actual roof form. So it'll subdivide building footprints and into their various pieces and, and get various levels, you know, be it a, a flat roof or a, a pitched roof. And that is all coming from the local government solution from Esri. Um, where you could be taking the, the the lidar data that you're getting from Lariac, and and go through that solution uh, in in uh, in Pro, and uh, create your own 3D buildings. Uh, that was one of the uh, the solutions that I um, that my team at Esri worked on with the local government team when I was was there. And it's consistent. It's constantly being updated. It will also now extract trees. Uh, there's a, a a big improvement coming in November to do better tree extraction. Um, and then it'll also extract bridges now, which is pretty cool enhancement. Very cool. That's neat. Okay. We have time for one more question, it looks like. So this one came in. Um, can all the functions you mentioned uh, be performed by ArcGIS Urban, or are there other 3D software products that you'd recommend? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so, you know, when we look at, um, when we look at Urban, this is using urban and in terms of the level of detail, you know, it's by design, the intent is to create these very schematic buildings. Um, it's not intended to create a highly visual 3D experience. Um, now, when we look at what is created here, this information, um, this, this detailed information was uh, uh, the facades and everything that was done in City Engine, um, another Esri product. Um, out of the engine, that information is then exported and brought into the Unreal Engine um, to create this uh, gaming experience. So um, we happen to be using a predominantly Esri-based platform, um, but then the, you know being able to go from Esri into Unreal is a very simple pipeline as well. Sure. All right. Now, I would say that the creation of the rules to create this uh, this facading are, is not necessarily easy, <laughs> but once you've got it done, sure. going out to Unreal is, sure. is an easier process. Well, well, I will say this, and I'll do it. So, Brian, really, thank you for your for your presentation and your and your input and and joining us today. I'll say this too for everybody. Um, we put a link to the um, House Seal Levine 
Levine. Say it again, Levine. Dang it. Uh, to their to their exhibit hall page, their graphics will blow you away, and they do have links in there to some of the things they did for the Esri conference, with links to some projects that talk about the software that they use to make this, including Urban and SketchUp and Photoshop. You know, you guys use everything imaginable, and I think it's great. And with that and the planning stuff, it's a it's a really neat um, way to show and the power of graphics to make your case. So thanks again, Brian, really appreciate it. And uh, for everybody out there, we're gonna take a few minute break and we'll be back at the top of the hour for our last couple of presentations.